All right, it is it is seven o'clock. Let's do this. We're going to have a relatively uh, oh, well. It's the same number of slides as normal, so it's not necessarily any shorter. Uh, but we're going to have our time. We'll do a quick share out about how projects are going, and then once we get there, it'll be time to just use the second hour instead of a longer show and tell to just get some more work done on all the projects. So we're going to tidy up some ideas, start to think about how these link together, and we're still going on about machines. Next week, the unit is going to switch over to mechanisms, but that is like kind of an arbitrary difference. So uh, here, we, here we go. So thinking back to these three integrated parts, we're going to stay focused a little bit more this week on the active components part of this pyramid where there's the physical structure, the code base and active components, we're gonna to start to wander off towards code base by the time we get to the end, uh, but it's still an interesting thing to think about. And also because you have a project in mind, this will be really good to think about in the context of your project. So as you're imagining how your project relates, it'd be good to ask those questions as we're doing this. So let's see our topics. We're gonna to go through movement in machines and so there's, we're gonna categorize movement into a few different ways, into a few different types of motion. Uh, and then we're gonna look at step motion drives, which I know does not quite apply to the garden. Uh, you're gonna do time-based motion if you really stick to those peristaltic pumps, which is related, but not quite the same. And then we'll talk about steps per millimeter, which works for every single one of our CNCs throughout the space. Then we'll talk a little bit about end effector testing and like how you would do some of that I've done some of that tonight with Wagata already, which has been kind of fun. Uh, and then we'll have some more that we can do as we, as we think about going forward. But first off, in a machine, there's active components. There's the, the active parts, the things that do something that basically everything else is built around so that those active parts can do all that, they, that, they, that they're able to. And so that really sets the focus of the machine and it, does, it decides how code develops, how you build it, where things go, it, it can determine, the active components will determine the shape and the look. Often there's a lot of things that get decided by the active pieces so that you can maximize their value and their, their output. But a lot of it is giving things the ability to move. Most of, most of all of our machines are gonna have some sort of motion be a part of it. Although that doesn't strictly have to be true. But motion is critical for most machines, for many machines. So, Let's categorize it because moving in general is too, it's too much of a moving target. Uh, I wish I had something more clever in the pocket there, but uh, it is definitely something that we should try and categorize just to better understand it. And so I love this image. This is another one to throw back to those cardboard stages from Nadia Peak. And they took their design and thought about how can you put different linear motions together to get all sorts of crazy rotations and spinning and moving and sideways and two dimensions, three dimensions, uh, rotational things, all of that to, to move in different ways. But I think in my mind, I boil motions for machines down into two categories and just two, linear and rotational, that's it. Uh, once you get into there, there's steppers for controlling it there's dual and parallel linear motion, which is something that I think has got some serious cost benefits to that often is a subtle point. And then there's actuators, which are for short motions. And we'll talk about those. And then there's four different types of drives. We'll kind of circle back to that in a minute. And then there's the rotary motion, high speed rotation, geared high torque, stepper controller, and then actuators again. So first off our stepper motors. For the 3D printer that we're repurposing into the drawing bot for the sand, they look a lot like this. This is a NEMA 17 stepper motor. It's a very standard size format. The 17, NEMA stands for something, I'm not sure what. The 17 is the spacing for those holes if you were to drill holes and mount them into a panel. So it's a certain size specification for those stepper motors. And there's also, you can see varying lengths of stepper motor. This is a relatively short one, but by no means the shortest. There's middle, medium size and then the big beefy long ones that you can play with. Uh, and then there's little tiny steppers that don't fit that form factor at all. What's up? Well, so that's a good point and we're gonna come back to it. Stepper motors are more like the motor that often drives linear. So they do feel like they're kind of categorized as in between. When we move forward to here, 
this is how a stepper moves to linear. And so we're gonna kind of circle back to it. Uh, they definitely, they have rotation within them. The question was, are they rotational or linear? Uh, fundamentally, it's rotational, but we do a lot of things to take rotational motion, which motors always have to operate in a certain circle. And it really boils down to the physics of it, which is, I think, fascinating that what you need to have is a spinning system because when you rotate a magnetic, uh, an electric coil through a magnetic field, you get a magnetic force, an electric force that pushes on things uh, in such a way that you have a motor work. And there's a couple different ways to build motors, but in that they basically always spin. And then we do some trickery to make it turn into something linear. There's other, you can do pneumatic motion, but most of the time for our, our machines, we're gonna do electrical control. Air. Air, yeah. So you can get linear and there's a uh, linear drives they're trickier, harder. It's a whole other can of worms if we were to open that. So we're just going to put it in a box and say maybe later. Um, but stepper motors, what they do is they really do a nice job. And this is what sets them apart from different other types of motors is that they move very prescribed amounts. And so the, the standard stepper motor like this that you'd find on a 3D printer probably has 200 steps per revolution. And in a 360 degree circle, that's 1.8 degrees per step. So that's a fair amount of control that you have to make a rotation. And then if you gear it down, uh, you can make each one of those 1.8 1 degrees count for much, much less of a, of a degree in a circular rotation. Or if you translate it through some gears into linear motion, you have more and more control. So there's a lot of ways that you can really build out from a stepper motor to have fine-tuned control in any, any CNC in the space where you can have a vector path be followed, it's always boiling down to a stepper motor somewhere. So whether it's the laser or the vinyl cutter or the Gerber or the Shapoko or the water jet, they're all being driven by steppers because you can specify, I want you to move exactly this many steps in this direction and then have it go in other ways. So all of that is something that's really interesting to do. You can have an Arduino sort of brute force its way through this with a stepper motor and it's kind of fun to hook one of those up at the very first time but we do have some motor driver chips that do this really nicely and there's very dedicated integrated circuits that people have designed to make sure that you can use as few pins as possible on an arduino that you can optimize the power delivery that all of those different pieces can be worked out but these sorts of things work really nicely to to build in this motion and so when you have a stepper usually you're going to need to find a, a way to do it. And one of the most integrated ways is they sell stepper motors that have linear motion sort of baked into them. Instead of just having a, a cylinder come out on the end, these all have cylindrical or maybe a D-shaped shaft coming off the end. You can have these, which have a lead screw. And we're going to look at lead screws in a minute. But this is a screw that will spin. And as it does, that nut moves up and down along the screw. Right, this just like a, a regular righty tighty lefty loosey in the exact same way. If you can control that rotation, that will control whether that nut moves up or down, which lets you be able to raise or lower a 3D printer's bed in, in lots of different ways. These two are interesting to look at as we're thinking about those ways to add motion, because on the left of the Prusa, and we have one of those in the room, there's two Z axis stepper motors. And so those are denoted by these little pink arrows. They move up and down here, which is an interesting mechanism. It sort of doubles the, the muscle to lift and lower the bed. So it's a little bit stronger, but the trade-off is that you have binding that can happen. There's some dynamics when you do this. It's not, there's no one perfect solution that's gonna make it work every time, uh, but there's some tricks that we can do to try and make it less likely to fail. The Prusa does that by, by finding ways to try and stay as unlikely to bind as possible. So those two steppers have to stay in sync with each other. They, they're electrically connected a lot of the time so that if one gets driven, the other gets driven the exact same way. So you can never have them like go sideways and the whole gantry gets turned at some crazy angle and binds up and won't move. So this guy has, if you look at the Ultimaker down its back, it just has one lead screw. This vertical line is just a guide rail. So there's only one lead screw. There's no push that would force it to torque. Those are just bearings on the sides holding it together. 
it's a it's an interesting design choice. It has to be a stronger motor to do that. You have to have stronger pieces so that it can sort of hold it hanging out there without supporting it from both sides. Uh, and in some cases that works really well, but there's definitely like design choices that have to be put in. And it's why for the, the sand art, for the sand CNC, my first question was how hard is it to push the magnet around? That's my first question because it, it determines, do we need to try and put two motors? Do we need to get a big beefy one? If it's real lightweight and easy to move, then our whole situation gets a lot easier because it's you don't have to worry about all this extra torque. So there's a lot of dynamics that you have to think about as you're doing this for torque and, and those pieces. For a lot of our small scale projects, luckily we won't have to go deep into these weeds. If you wanted to design and, and sell a 3D printer, absolutely you should do the math to make sure that it's going to work exactly right every time. But for our like hack something together quickly, make sure that it works and as long as it doesn't break, no one's, it's not mission critical. It's not a parachute. It's not a, it's not one of those, it's not an airplane. Those things that have to work just right the first time, then we're gonna be good. But these are interesting design choices to think about for the forces that are in play. This being supported on two sides or this being supported just on one. And it's, it, at some level, it really is as fundamentally easy as think about picking up a chair, right? You hold it from two sides, it's nice and easy. It's easy to stay balanced. If you grab it with one hand, it's a lot easier to fall over, right? It's the same, same sort of deal. But as we're thinking about those kinds of movements, one thing to think about is how big is your movement? Not only is like how big is it strength wise, but how large does the throw of your movement need to be? Like on airplanes, you have these things called ailerons, which are the little things on the back that you see go up and down when one day we'll all get on airplanes again, when you're waiting for it to, when you're taxiing around and you see them do the tests. The little the flaps on the back of the wing those just move up and down and they often don't need to move very far and actually when like when boeing buys these they buy really heavy duty specific ones that do exactly exactly that and they move just a short distance at high torque but for a lot of hobby projects uh i had a grandfather who liked rc airplanes and so for rc airplanes just a standard hobby servo motor can be embedded in the wing like you see up here at the top and these can't move very far. This little actuator on a servo just sort of goes back and forth, maybe 90 or 180 degrees. But if you look at this mechanism, if this white arm moves backwards, that whole grabber arm here moves this way. And through this mechanism, it moves that aileron down, which is just enough. That's all it takes to, to take the plane and pitch it in one way or the other. And if you're controlling those carefully, that's enough to make a plane steer. So there's plenty of applications where you may need only tiny movements to make something happen. It's, it raises an interesting question of what sort of scale do you need to have for motion to work? Servos are great for little actuators. Here's another good example, like a draw bot with a pen. This, I, I puzzled at this picture for a little bit, but it's a pen that's being held by clips on a pretty heavy little unit that can only move vertically up and down. The servo back there has a little horn that will stand up and when it stands up, the pen is off the paper. And when it lays flat, the pen's weight holds it down onto the paper. So it's a simple little mechanism with an actuator like movement, right? When you're writing with your hand with a pen on paper, in order to not write, you just lift it off very slightly. The same thing is happening from this robot. That little blue servo in there is just able to lift the pen slightly off the paper that it's going over but you can see all these bearings and, and belts and things to try and make it move sideways. There's a whole host of stepper motors that would get it to draw the pictures that you want, but the final end actuator could be just a short, the end effector could be just a short actuator movement of lift the pen, lower the pen, which is, which is interesting. Those sorts of elements of your movement are really important to think about and how do you wanna factor them in? The, these are all examples with a servo and servos are really good at this sort of actuator movement. But there's other types of movement. So coming back to our list between linear and rotary, we should also, and we're gonna get to drives in a minute, uh, rotational motion or rotary motion is another important thing. Motors fundamentally, because they have a spinniness to them, they're often most efficient at high speed. And there's lots and lots of applications where high speed is what you want. Whether it's a spindle on a CNC, whether it's the, the drive wheels on a little RC car or the propellers on a drone, high speed applications 
low torque, high speed is, is when a motor is gonna be its most efficient. And so that means that your drone will fly a little longer if it flies at full speed. Uh, if, it's, if you stall a motor, if you keep it from turning, that's when it uses the most of its energy. You can actually melt the inside of some cheap motors by holding them still because they'll pass so much current that it'll start to melt things inside. Uh, because when they spin, they're slowly breaking and making their current connections. So there's little intermittent seconds where it's not powered, which is kind of crazy also. And this is a simple cheap motor inside of one of these. You, these are the sort of thing, I grew up in Ohio, so Cedar Point was near, nearby. On a hot summer day at Cedar Point, you would buy a $2 fan that you'd blow on yourself while waiting in line for a roller coaster. These were the motors that are like a dime if you were to buy them in bulk. And they are very, very simple, cheap motors. Nope. Uh, but they have little brushes down at the bottom. They're the kind of thing where you plug in power and they just go. The peristaltic pumps that the gardening team is working on or is working with, those are DC brush motors just like this. High speed rotation lets you get a lot of things done and it works in a lot of places. This is actually the motor out of, I think, a computer fan. Right? So this is a different, a different mechanism. Instead of being a brushed motor, that's a brushless motor and so is the drone fans uh, and this thing over here. But these are other ways where you're using high speed rotation with a different type of motor to get certain jobs done. And that, that works in lots of different places. If we were building a drone, we'd totally wanna to be talking about this and going a lot deeper into those, into those places. Uh, but, one thing that often comes up, and as, as we've talked a fair amount about like how much strength do you need inside your motion and how does it bind, a lot of times you'll hear the word torque get brought up, that you need high torque or you need a lot of weight, a lot of strength to lift something. On the Prusa, they need those two motors to, to lift it up. Torque is often something that you get out of a motor, not because the motor inherently has a lot of it, but because you add a gearbox onto the front end. These yellow ones are my favorite. These are really good to use with kids because they're like, maximum $3. They're easy to use. They've got little brush motors on them and you just plug them in and they work. This video of Lego gears is kind of insane. You can hit unbelievable gear ratios with Legos. Uh, and so here they've done this where they geared down the motor from 375 rotations per minute to one rotation per minute to make a second hand on the clock with the right sort of gear ratios. It would be much, much harder to stop that little hand than it would be to stop the one that's flying around really quickly. Adding in those gear steps slows it down, but what you get as a trade-off for that slowed movement is very, very high torque. There's definitely an art, I was looking for it, but didn't know where to find it, an art installation where some artists build a gear train and the last gear is half sunk into concrete in the side of the building. And the front of the gear train is a motor that's just spinning full tilt. If you gear it enough, that last one will never move or it will move so slowly that the fact that it's embedded in concrete doesn't matter. There's some crazy gear ratios that you can hit, but if you buy a motor like this one with a gear train built on it, it'll usually be spec for a certain amount of foot pounds of torque or maybe Newton meters of torque. And you'll get a much slower rotation, but a much higher power output. These little yellow ones, I've commonly bought them at 120 rotations per minute and 90 rotations per minute. And the 90 rotations per minute is much, much higher torque. The, yeah. Oh, that is a, that's a good question. Okay. So the question was, can I explain what foot pounds of torque are? Um, a foot. So it boils down to a good physics explanation. Uh, when, when we talk about how much we weigh in the English system. And this is gonna feel silly for Cedric, who's French. When we talk about how much we weigh in the American system, we talk about our weight in pounds, which is actually the force of gravity pulling on us, as opposed to the metric system where you directly describe how much matter you have by your kilograms, your mass. Those are different things. So the force of gravity is pounds. And so basically you can directly translate that into the force of the engine when you talk about it in terms of foot pounds. The foot part is talking about how long is your lever arm. So it's like lever arm length plus a force put together, which is a weird, that's why it's Newton meters in the metric system, meters for length, Newtons for force. 
it's a, it's a goofy system and it gets used in cars all the time, which is where I'm sure you're hearing it. <laughs> yeah, the, but, it's, but it's fascinating to see that happen. Torque is just like a, it's a rotary force. It's just a rotating, it's a force that causes rotary motion. And there's a lot of, it's a, yeah, is the short, short version. It's f forces normally push or pull in a straight line. Torque is the rotary version of that. Just like angular acceleration or angular velocity are interesting things. It's a great unit in a physics class to, to really confuse your, your AP physics students in case you're curious. This thing right here, uh, this is just a video. I don't know. I found this 10 minute video of someone just going through all sorts of different gear combinations for Legos. That's really fascinating. There's a ton. There are definitely entire science courses dedicated to Lego uh, robotics, Lego gearing. There's, there's entire competitions across the country for it. <laughs> I mean, this is fascinating to watch. Um, and then there's also these little things. These motors right here, even though they don't look it, these are about the size of a quarter. If you were to buy them, uh, they're, they're lots of fun, these little ones right here. And then this, we have one of these over in the metal shop. We're gonna use this to make the thing that will crunch up plastic to recycle plastics and be able to use them in the injection molder. So there's a lot of interesting things to take a look at when you've got gear trains that can really take a high speed motion and turn it into a high torque motion. And, and essentially, the trade-off you get is you lose a lot of speed, but you get back a lot of force. And so that's, that's the dynamic that you're looking at with any gear train. You can also do it in reverse. You can, you can gear in such a way that you sacrifice force for speed, which curiously, the most common place in, that you interact with that exact opposite of what you'd expect gearing is in your own body. Your muscles are a lot stronger than they really need to be. But like the, if you feel where your bicep connects to your forearm, it connects in such a way that that strength is communicated into speed across your wrist. But we could go into torque and levers and, and how that fits in with the body for a long time. We should keep moving. Uh, so how do you actually use these ideas of torque and motion and motors to get all these things to, to go? Here are four key strategies that you definitely should have seen and looked at and thought about a little bit as we look at motors and mechanisms. The one that we sort of led into was the lead screw and that's this screw here. And as the stepper motor spins the shaft that moves along as it goes. If, if, you, if I'm feeling gutsy, I'll even occasionally spin stepper motors in a 3D printer to try and move the bed up or down a, a controlled amount. The Maker Gear 3D printer, which I'm really familiar with, has a single vertical stepper and they put a knob on top so that you could on the fly manually adjust the height of the print bed, just like with a knob that was built in just for that purpose. It's an interesting trick. Then there's rack and pinion gears. These are really common on larger CNCs like the Gerber. The Gerber is actually all lead screws, which kind of blows my mind for a large CNC. Um, however, I, the last one, a shop bot like Cedric has in his, in his shop, that is definitely a rack and pinion gear that runs those machines. They put a rack along the long straight parts of the machine and then the steppers that guide its motion all have pinion gears. There's various levels of pinion gear, but these are non-standard gears. They're definitely tricky and weird. They look like they should be simple, but their, their gear geometry gets real complicated real fast. Um, this is sort of the flat straight ones. These are the flat straight ones. These are angled. If you can find one that looks like the teeth are in a V shape, those are the absolute best. They have full constant contact all the way across, but they're impossibly hard to machine. So they're very expensive. Not impossibly hard. They're just very hard to machine. This chain sprocket system is one I would not include if it weren't for the Maslow CNC. I'm just including it for that one thing. If you look, this is a CNC kit that you can buy for 500 bucks. Uh, Make Haven should probably not invest in one. They're just so cool that I need to mention it. Uh, instead of using a whole geared system or lead screws or any of that, they have chains that hold up an end, a router and the router is held down by the weight of two bricks. And then using polar math, polar coordinate systems, they can lengthen or shorten these two strings and then draw out shapes. We have the draw bot in the back corner. It's very much the same system but much, much bigger and beefier. 
So it's a, it's a $500 CNC. You can like attach to the rafters in a garage and pull down when you want to cut a piece out of a sheet of plywood. I've definitely dreamed about having one of these in my own garage one day. Uh, but you know, that's, that's a pipe dream. Are they, are they pretty good? They're short answers in the middle. Yes. On the sides, not so much as you it's a, because they're related by trigonometric functions, the further out of the middle you get, the less linear their control gets. And someone will figure that out in software one day, but the current versions are still getting their wings. Uh, and then there's tooth belts. These show up most frequently in 3D printers because they work really reliably. They're really good systems. You get full engagement with the stepper motor. Uh, you get lots of motion control accuracy. And usually the smaller this, this drive gear is, the more accuracy you get. Remember a stepper can step usually at 1.8 degrees per rotation or per step. And so if this is super tiny, each rotation moves the belt only a very, very small amount. And so your resolution gets better and better and better the smaller your tooth gear gets. As long as you're like, your belt isn't past its bend radius and a few other things. But essentially the smallest you can get here uh, on these drive gears, the better you get. These show up very commonly on printers because they are much better than a lead screw for accuracy. To compare these next to each other, the, ch the chain sprocket is just a weird other one. It's really neat, but, but still definitely not the best. Uh, the lead screw is a good workable option. And with a nice lead screw, it can be a good way to go. For most like hobbyist level things, 3D printer level things, it would be the worst of these options though, uh, just because of the price point and quality that they're built at for 3D printers. Then there's the tooth belts are a nice next level up option. Uh, if you're looking for making a higher quality machine and the highest end are the rack and pinion gears, but they're very expensive usually. What's up? Yeah. The screw spins and the nut takes as the threads spin, the nut is sort of moved along. I can, I should have gotten a bolt and a nut to show you if I hold the nut still and spin the screw, the screw moves linearly through the nut. Yep. Exactly. Yep, it's got the screws. So the screws spin the and that moves the nut along the screw linearly, but it's that rotation that turns into linear motion with the lead screw. There's there's ways to make them nicer. Like you can get anti backlash nuts that go on them. Those are really fun. They're like spring loaded. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can solve this. But the backlash in a lead screw system is why they're not the greatest, but they're totally workable for most projects. Um, and they work really well for us. The Gerber's using them, so they've got to be fine. What's up? One thing about the chain sprocket, if you've ever fancied that drum on the top of a building, the cool thing about that system and it's the only tool we've ever actually yeah. used is the fact that it doesn't cost more to the user. It's just a longer chain, right? So for example, if you attach those two motors on the side of the building, you can make three chains the whole building. Yeah. No, that's that's a good point. And just for the sake of repeating for Zoom. Uh, you can scale the chain sprocket as much as you want, and there's there's no cost to it. It's definitely something that I I was very I had several friends who were artists, and I tried to pitch that idea to many of them, and they were they just didn't buy it that I could scale up a spray paint design for that long. It's it's you could ab I mean it would be awesome to take one of those chain sprocket systems and build it so that it drew just like the little guy over there on the wall. And then an actuator that's a servo just to hit a spray paint can. It's, it already exists. It's, I know I, it's Drobo is the name. Dro, dro, drawing bot, drawing bot. I, it, yep, there's, there are people who do it. It's really cool. Uh, I'd love to, if anybody over the summer wants to try and do that somewhere big across New Haven, I'm in. Sounds like a great time. <laughs> a blank wall over on the street. I think we need a permit, but yeah, I'm in. Sounds like fun. The, or to be very quick, no, we need a permit. <laughs> Ask forgiveness, not permission is a good motto. Uh, steps per millimeter. Okay, so, so let's say you have these stepper motors. You're talking about rotations and whatever. 
Um, the short version is you need to get this right in order for your CNC to work correctly. If you were using the Shapoko prior to our Shapoko unit or early in our Shapoko unit, Kate ran into this problem. The steps per millimeter were off on the Shapoko. And so remember, Kate, you had to keep lying to tell it to go deeper and deeper and deeper to hit the depth that you wanted it to. It's steps per millimeter setting was off. Usually it's not in, in most firmware is where this is stored. So you have a machine like the Shapoko, there's a software system that runs the machine. Somewhere in there, there's a variable that stores in information. Oh, to go exactly one inch, I need to travel 214.6 steps, right? And so somewhere in the software, it stores that variable. And if that variable is off, your travel will be wrong. So having that be perfectly tuned is really important. On the Shapoko, it was off for a little bit. It has since been fixed, but it was definitely off since the summer up through the time of our Shapoko unit when we realized it was really a problem. What's up? Yeah, if you scale the entire thing up, your middle gets larger with it. And I think that that, broadly speaking, is going to be true. Plus, the larger it gets, if your motors and chains stay roughly the same size, your steps per millimeter would stay the same size. So you'd have higher resolution anyways, because you'd have more millimeters across your, your drawing, right? If you, you'd have, if you have the same motors and, and chain and sprocket, and it doesn't get any bigger or smaller when you scale the project up, the millimeters stay the same, but your picture gets 15 times larger. Now you've got much better resolution in your picture, sort of. I mean, depends on how you want to define resolution, I guess. But you can you have more control over where the, the business end goes in that case. It's an interesting conversation to have when you're really thinking about these machines at scale. Uh, and it's definitely something that can be that can be made to work. In any case, there's whole calculators for this. It's not something that you'll probably need to do very often if you're building a machine, but it's definitely something to keep in mind if it's broken and it feels like it's not traveling just enough in one or two directions. It's, it's a question that you should know that you need to be able to ask if you're interested. Sure. Yo, what's up? What, what do you do with the Shapoko to fix There is a setting. So Shapoko does not spell this out cleanly. Uh, for steps per millimeter. They asked what type of Z-axis lead screw you were using, and we had selected the wrong one. It, and lead screws are often not labeled, so it wasn't clear to, to do it. I just tried different options that they had until I found the one that did have the right, the right distance. I think they have like three options in easel. So uh, it's, it's an interesting set of questions to ask. If you use the Gerbil version of their control, I think you'd be able to set this more explicitly. But those are pretty much all of our motion things as we're talking about these machines. So for the CNC drawbot, that's definitely something that we're thinking about if you're imagining sort of larger scale projects that you might be building. Uh, those are all the motion pieces. But really for most machines, the end effector is where, is where it happens. And so for a lot of 3D printers, your end effector looks like this where you've got a heated nozzle. This is a heater right here. It's got a thermometer coming off. There's like this cooling fin so that it stays cool just above it. Uh, this is what most 3D printers look like. But the end effector can be very different on very different machines, even when their motion is very similar. So like this is a 3D, this is from an article on adapting any 3D printer to print ceramics. So instead of having a 3D printer that prints out plastic, you instead use a nozzle like that and have it ooze out a ceramic material at just the right speed. And now all of a sudden you're 3D printing pottery, which is fascinating. Then you can fire that in a kiln and have three digitally laid out pottery that you've designed. Same rules would apply, no overhangs. You'd have supports that you have to worry about. There's lots of things that come along with that. Flow rates are tricky, but it's an interesting one. Another really interesting one is the pancake bot down over here. I have played with those. They are as exciting as it sounds. Uh, you draw out pictures, you decide your color. And if you want it darker, it lays it down earlier. If you want it lighter in color, it lays it down later. If you squint at this really closely, it's a little astronaut that they drew out. Those are really fun. 
Oh, we have one? Oh, it visited. Yeah, they're neat. The, at some point, the Fab Foundation had a very large number of them that they tried to, that they came into possession of. And so it's fascinating. I think that they tried to give them away to teachers who would do a workshop on how to use them. But I don't know how many they still have. The, yeah, it's the 3D printer nozzle, the, the, the tube where the, yeah, it's where the material comes out, but it could also be a laser. So like these three machines over here in the right-hand corner, the end effector on this machine from Creality, you can swap them out. So there's a 3D printing end effector. There's a laser engraving end effector where instead of 3D printing, you pull out the 3D printing nozzle and you put in a laser so that it'll laser cut. And then there's also an end mill that you can put on to that same machine. So it's got hot, like relatively easy to swap out end effectors. So the same motion controlled machine has different end effectors. The same thing for there's one over here, there's one over here. These get a lot of attention on Kickstarter because they're supposed to be great. I've never personally used one, but I think if they were really that awesome, we would probably have tried them by now. Uh, I'm not, I, just because of the connection point often between the moving parts and the end effector needs to be rock solid. The fact that they're interchangeable makes it a little, a little suspect. Um, and I just have this, I'm, I feel like I'm connected enough to the maker news that if there was one of these, that was the, the best thing in the world, we would know about it. Cedric would know about it at the very least. You have any of these multiple end effector things that work for you? Uh, no, but For sure. Yep. Yeah, you can. This is really good to do if you have old 3D printers, and we have old 3D printers. So if you wanted to take one of the printers in the back and swap them out to make a new machine here, it would be a fascinating thing to do. The, the only real difference I'd say between one of our 3D printers and the PancakeBot is that it's built around a griddle. And it's like built around a $20 Walmart griddle. It's not like a deep earth magic griddle or anything special. It's just like a off the shelf griddle that you put in the middle of the thing. And they build it all around that. The ones that I played with had a lead screw and a belt drive. And that was that was it to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Like if you if you took our Tormach, which is the nicest CNC machine that we have here, you could swap out its end effector and do all of that with that machine. But generally it's too expensive and nice of a machine that you you wouldn't want to do that. And people who are buying these machines, these like three in one deals, they're trying to save a buck, right? And so they don't want to buy the beefiest movement architecture so that they can really support all three of those things. They're, the people who are making them make trade-off choices to keep them affordable for price. But it usually sacrifices in some way that makes at least one of the three not as good. Usually, I think it's the CNC that usually, it's like a, you can CNC styrofoam and that's, that's it. You know, something, something that still keeps the load very low on the machine. Like a belt drive would not be good for an end mill because the belts are good, but they are stretchy. And so if you have a belt drive and it's got to push with a high force, the belt drive is going to slip. You're going to have other sorts of problems that come up with that. Uh, but let's, let's say you have an end effector, you're really into it, you want to make this end effector work and you're starting it from scratch. The first thing you're going to have to do is figure out low level control. And low level control is actually, a, it's a low level programming, low level control is a technical term. It's not like a, it, and it's not so judgmental about something. It's saying that this is the close to the machine logic. It's close to the ones and the zeros of how do you make it work? If I apply 12 volts, it runs. If I turn 12 volts off, it turns off. 
that sort of like the lowest, most fundamental pieces, the, the bricks of the pyramid that you're building, right? Those are the pieces that you're looking for. And so in the case of a 3D printer, uh, there's two controls that usually run to a nozzle. The first one is this red line and that's the heating element that's poking out right here. That's heating up this little block of metal that the filament is forced through and is gonna all heat up together. And a heater is just apply power and it gets hot, turn off power and it starts to cool down. That's it. And at a lowest level control, you really just need to apply power or no power. So usually there's some logistics that you have to work out and test, does this really work the way you want it to? If you're gonna build an entire complicated system around a motor and how it functions or a heater and how it does its thing, you wanna really understand that motor or heater or whatever it is. So understanding your low level control is really, really important. And it's also while you're thinking about this, a good time to ask questions of, do you want any feedback? In the thing that's shown here, those white lines are for a thermometer. They're for uh, an RTC, they're for a thermometer. Let's just not get into the specifics of how that works. But it's for a specific type of digital thermometer that can measure the temperature of the, of the heater itself. And so you might wanna have feedback in some things, heaters especially. There have been cases of 3D printers that do turn into house fires. A lot of things have to break in just the right way, all, all at the wrong time for that to happen. Uh, but it is, it is a piece that happens. In the firmware baked into every 3D printer, and this might even be by, by it's probably by European law by now would be my guess. Uh, but they have to have a, if it gets too hot, the whole thing shuts off. So that's definitely a part of 3D printers uh, where it's built in. You can do that in software, you can do it in whatever, but if you can know the temperature and have a heater, now you've got the start for a control system. And we're gonna talk about control systems next week with PID and bang bang control and a few other weird names for systems that don't immediately make sense. But low level control is asking the question about how do you power it? How does it behave? And then do you want any feedback that goes along with it? For the sake of our CNC drawing machine, the feedback is sort of like, did it draw the picture or not? Which is pretty, perhaps self-evident. For the garden, we may want to have more feedback. Like, did it water? Did enough water go through? Did it, did it work all the way? You may want to have feedback on that system just to say if your plants are healthy or not. And so monitoring your plants and their health and their state of being watered, not watered, could be an interesting feedback to add in, given the, the projects we're going after. Yeah, that is, that is required in all 3D printers, I think now. Yep. Yep. And it's a very, it, it can do that on a very, even at a very low level is what I'm going to say is the way you describe it. But I would do that in the electronics for the thermal runaway protection. I would not do it in code. Like you could do it in code where if the temperature gets too high or you can't read the temperature, then cut power. But for things that are important that could lead to house fires, that's where you want to really have an automatic shutoff. And so that brings us nicely into testing these things. When you're testing your end effectors, when you're looking for low level control, you're going to want to ask like, what are the limits in the machine? How hot does it get? How much power does it draw? Those sorts of questions become really relevant while you're starting to understand the very edge of how it works and then figuring out the quirks. Uh, and then automatic shutoff is, is what Cedric was talking about with that thermal runaway. If, if I'm, I'm probably measuring temperature with a voltage divider, and if at the voltage divider head, it goes to, to ground or power, I know that probably my thermometer is broken somehow, whether the cord broke or whatever. I should know enough about the electronics if I'm building this thing so that I know the way that it's likely to fail, if it becomes disconnected, if it's gonna get too hot, if any of those things happen, so that I can make electrical systems work so that if it breaks, it automatically shuts off, even if the computer is like disconnected and it's just running on power, right? There's, there's definitely some control things that you wanna put in there so that you have runaway control. But then there's also these big red buttons, which are really good to add. You should definitely add a big red button to any project you ever make for moral reasons, one, 
uh, and because they're beautiful big red buttons, but two, uh, because it's important to have a kill switch. And on a bigger, larger machine, you definitely wanna have that. On the Gerber, you need those kill switches everywhere because you do not want, you do not wanna even try to stop it with your hand. You wanna have a button where you can, you can say the, it's, it's something's wrong, stop the machine. And all of, those, all of those kill switches are wired in such a way, and, and yeah, they're wired in such a way that even if the cable just comes loose, it's gonna shut off, even if you didn't press the button. It's wired so that any sort of failure mode that gets close to pressing the button, effectively the button's pressed. I've definitely been standing around the Gerber wondering why it won't turn on, and Lior and I find that one of these is disconnected somehow, which is actually a feature, it's not a bug. You want it to stop itself very easily because you don't want to have a, a situation where it's in some sort of a uncontrollable motion. So that's definitely a, a good value to have. But there's a fair amount of electrical testing that can go into there. And the more you're deep in the weeds on the electrical engineering for this, the easier this is going to come. But there's, there's certainly a lot of good guidance about how to control steppers or end mills or those sorts of things on a pretty fundamental level. So there's a lot that we can work on here. Now, while you're doing that, while you're deciding all those things about your low level, when you're testing them, when you're thinking about your end effector and how to control it at its most basic function, you'll wanna to start to think about how you're gonna write the code. Like how does, this, how does this object turn into something that makes sense to write code for? And how do I power it, right? As you're, if you realize that your heating element at 24 volts can take up to two amps of current, then you need to start to build in a MOSFET that will allow that much power to be handled, right? You're gonna to have to start to think about from the measurements and observations that you took of your end effector and your motors, how do you handle all of that? If we're repurposing parts from 3D printers, that's probably a solved problem for us. But if you're building something brand new, it's definitely some math that you're gonna to have to take into consideration. And this is where MOSFETs and stepper motor drivers uh, like this can really be helpful. And then down here, we've got an interesting pack where this is a geared motor on a, on a stepper motor, a gearbox on a stepper motor. And then you have a stepper motor driver like this along the back here. And even sometimes they put encoders on those to measure how they're moving. But that's another feedback system that we'll get to later. That's a good, it's a, the best example I've got is that I output to this heater power, right? And it's gonna get warmer and warmer and warmer. And then that's gonna be a computer system that's giving it power. Feedback would be that the computer system can read the temperature. So it's not just putting power out and hoping that it works. Feedback is when you get information back, like the temperature of that hot end so that you can make actions. Like the serial monitor in Arduino. Sort of, exactly like the serial monitor in Arduino. Uh, gives you feedback that your code has worked. In the case of this, I would want, the simplest control system that we'll talk about next week is bang bang control. And it's sort of, it's a little, let's uh, uh, a little Neanderthalish. Too cold, apply power. Too hot, turn off power. That's it. Like that's the that's bang bang control. Like if it's not hot enough, make it hotter. If it's too hot, cool it down. That's all it's got. So that's a feedback system where you apply heat until it's over the threshold temperature you want. Then it cuts power. Once it cools back down below then it's gonna heat it back up again. So it's a really simple like off on, off on. There's more elegant solutions than that. But that is the feedback control loop that we're gonna talk about next week. Um, and so those are interesting things to start to think about as you're doing the system is how do you put out control and how do you get back information about it? If you're thinking about an end mill spinning, you could put a tachyometer, like a rotational measurement tool to measure how much it's spinning uh, to see is it spinning fast enough? Has it slowed down? Has it sped up? And those are definitely things that they do, like on the belt sander has feedback in that system. If you've run the giant drum, drum sander, belt sander that we have in here, forget the exact name of those things, even though I use them, uh, it has a variable feed rate. And so as you're pushing a piece through, if it realizes that the drum is being slowed down because it's got too much torque that it takes to move that thing forward, it'll slow the belt down as a, as a measure of response to that feedback. So it's actively sensing what sort of energy does it take to make that happen. And then it can change its actions based on that information that it gets back. So it's an interesting control system that leads to much smarter tools, much smarter machine. And we'll talk about it a lot in next week's system.
But then the last thing for while we're thinking about control is to talk about high level functions. We talked about low level control and the opposite is high level functions, which is a little, it's an abstract concept for sure. It's definitely wandering into code territory, uh, but a high level function is a function or part of a program where you don't need to go into the turn off, turn on, turn off, turn on. Like you're not in those logistics anymore. You've written some code that handles the off and on for you for like fading an LED. And you just write something like analog, write, tell it the pin number and tell it, I want it to be half brightness. So you're putting in sort of information about what you'd like to happen. And then it does it in response instead of controlling directly the, the actions or motions of the electronics. Analog right, I really like, because here on line 16, analog right, LED brightness, you're inputting which LED you want and how bright do you want it to be, and you don't have to worry at all about the fact that the LED is really blinking on and off really fast. A high level function like this one keeps it simple for you, the end, or the end user. This is really important for when you get to G-code control, because the G-code is gonna say, I want the spindle at 12,000, please. I'd like the extruder to go 123 millimeters forward. And I'd like the temperature to be at 214. You don't wanna to have to worry about the logistics of how you get to 214. You want the software to do that for you. And your G code is just giving those high level commands for what it should do. So if you have a, if you have a system and you're building it from the ground up, you'll need to do all that low level stuff and then build up a code framework so that ultimately you can give it high level controls. Like for the garden, I imagine we want to get it to a point where Lior can press a button and say, okay, water the plants. And it'll do stuff in the background, but he's got the very highest level function of press one button when you'd like the plants to be watered. It does all the stuff, maybe gives him a report about how that works, but you really raise the level of control so that it can be used very, very simply with a very basic input. So high level functions are really interesting uh, as you think about the progression from low level control to high level control. And they're a great opportunity to bring back OOP, object oriented programming. So if you have a whole bunch of things in a machine that are repetitive or that have actions that they can execute, methods that they could run, this is a really good time to head back to object oriented programming. And I find that it's the easiest when your code is mimicking real life. If I have three stepper motors and they all basically work the same, it would make a lot more sense for me to write a code object to control a stepper motor and then just invoke it three times than to write the same thing three times in a, in a code base, right? That, that would actually be really bad code to write um, if you wrote the same thing three times. Or if you imagine like the touchpad buttons on a phone, right? I wanna describe how a button works one time and then say, here are my nine buttons, they each work like this it raises the level of your programming from instead of listen to the pin and do that. If you write your objects correctly, they'll listen, they'll do all that low level stuff within themselves. And you just say something like, if, if the button is pressed, take this action. So that you can keep your code focused on high level things when you get to it. It, it feels like there may be instances where you're tempted to blend high and low level, but the more you keep them separated, the easier it is to think about them as sort of isolated events. Like how do I control this button? How do I control the heater? How do I control the motor? And then once those sort of low level problems are solved, you can start to ask yourself questions about the higher level functions, which is a really interesting dynamic to think about as you're imagining a machine. And we'll, we'll circle back to this. We'll talk more about object oriented programming and how it fits. And we'll look at these examples, but there's, there's a lot to process and, and, consider if you're writing the code for one of these machines. But next week, just for the sake of clarity, um, next week we're gonna talk about feedback loops and control functions, which is exactly what we were hinting at, that the, the, gr laid, the groundwork has been laid. The pipe is, I don't know. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about feedback loops with movement and end stops. We're gonna talk about which end stops we've been running into with the CNC machine in here already, uh, which is great. We're gonna talk about motor encoders to measure motion as it goes. That's a neat one. Then end effector feedback sensors like the thermometer on the 3D printer nozzle and then control functions. Bang, bang is the one where it's off on and PID is proportional, integral and, and direct, which is 
actually using calculus to control your machines. And it works really nicely and you can tune it really well. Uh, differential. differential, yeah, differential, not direct. You're right, proportional, integral, and differential control. And those three elements together are how you can make a robot that works just like BB-8 works where it can balance up on one wheel and keep its head upright, as, as well as many other things. Most 3D printers heated beds run under PID control where they heat them up and when they get closer to the target temperature, they slow down their heating actually. So they don't just like go all the way up and then turn off when they overheat. It's much more stable, you get much nicer pieces and it gives you three variables to sort of tune the performance of that. It's a neat trick. What does PID stand for? It's proportional, integral and Differential, thanks. I immediately forgot it. it. We're gonna talk about it all next week, or well, part of next week. And then startup calibration is another thing. Anytime that you start a 3D print, you'll notice the machine probably does a few things. That's often really important when a machine gets started for it to measure and know where its home is and where, what the temperature's at and all those sorts of calibration pieces and why you'd wanna include that into your machines. So we'll talk about these are the things for next week, which is definitely gonna be more interesting stuff. And hopefully we'll have machines that are even further along and getting close to drawing in sand or watering plants. <laughs>